My next guest is uh, Rob Malley. Uh, he's Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. Served as Special Assistant to the President, President Clinton that is, for Arab-Israeli Affairs uh, and as Director for Democracy and Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs at the National Security Council. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Thanks for having me. Um, there was a meeting between the, the, the Russians and the Arab League uh, in Cairo. And it, it, there are reports that there was a five-point plan that was agreed to, an end of violence, uh, inspection, monitoring uh, operation set up, uh, no external influence, unimpeded humanitarian aid, and support for the Kofi Annan mission. Um, it sounds reasonable to me. Sure. It seems sure. like it uh, comports with some of the proposals or recommendations that the crisis group in, in its paper uh, put forward as, as the framework. But how, how likely is this that it could even happen, one, what would it take to make it happen, two, um, and a chance for success? Now, it's very hard to be optimistic, particularly given what's happened in the last few days, the increase in violence, the increased militarization, and, and sectarian aspects of the conflict. So it's hard to be optimistic, uh, and particularly, you know, step one of this plan is ceasefire. Very hard to see the regime not shooting when they're protesters. I'm not justifying it, but they will shoot if there's protesters, and I can't imagine the protests stopping because they have many reasons to want to protest. So it's hard to see how you're going to de-escalate. I think the best way would probably be to get an agreement on some kind of political formula, which would then be the reason why they would de-escalate. And to get that agreement, the key, and you mentioned it, is to get the Russians on board, the Russians to be able, and to get them on board, they're going to have to preserve their, some of their interests and their assessment of what is necessary for Syria. In other words, a smoother kind of transition than what the opposition and some in the West and some in the Arab world have in mind. And for the Russians to send, deliver this message to the regime, you're going to have to accept certain things, a certain a transition in order for, if you want to continue to enjoy our support, we're not there yet. Both sides uh, have been emboldened by the support that they've received externally. Uh, the, the regime obviously feels that they can win this, or at least seem to operate as if they can, and the Russian-Chinese vetoes at the UN gave them a, a lifeline. But the opposition itself uh, has been getting support. Uh, you now have what was a conflict in Syria, yeah. now becoming a conflict over Syria with Russian, Western, uh, aspect to it with a, an Arab Iranian aspect to it as well as the internal uh, dynamic uh, there. A Russian US uh, and Arab League uh, agreement would do one thing but what can deal with some of the other aspects of this? Um, what do you do about the Arab Iranian uh, conflict that's obviously playing out as well? You know, one of the great tragedies, I mean, what happened in Syria, at the beginning it was, it appeared to be a genuine, genuine popular uprising. One of the tragedies, uh, and there are many in this conflict, and it's the most tragic of the Arab uprisings, is the degree to which different agendas have now been uh, uh, added to that initial conflict. I mean, agendas, as you say, having to do with Iran, having to do with Hezbollah, having to do with Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Israel, United States. That's just making things much more complicated and, and, and risks ha having Syria both an arena for proxy war, but also, as we know from history, Syria is serving as a platform to export and, and probably would spill over into Jordan, into Turkey, into Lebanon. So, I mean, I, it's, it's hard to, to see how you insulate the conflict. For, for, it's now too late because so many ent countries now have a very existential uh, stake almost in the outcome of what's happening there. Calls to arm the opposition, uh, worrisome, or they think it's helpful. Yeah. Part of me, I remember a, a, something you told me years ago when the Clinton administration was in its waning days and the Palestinians were saying uh, they don't care if there's a new government here or a new government in Israel, it can't get any worse, and you said it always can get worse. When I hear folks in Syria talk about that and they say 8,000 have died, and I say, it can be 80,000, it can be 180,000. I mean, Which we of saw course doesn't, and, and you can understand why that doesn't really change their mind. 8,000 is a lot, and, yeah. and many. But we saw it in Lebanon. Yeah. I mean, this can go from where it is now to, to hell itself. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a human, natural, and ominous reaction. I mean, all, all, all three of them, the, the notion that they want to be armed, of course they want to be armed. And some weapons are already coming in, not as much as some countries are claiming, but, uh, or the regime is claiming, but some weapons are coming in. The problem, of course, is this is going to become more militarized and the likelihood that the civil war will become a full-fledged civil war. The 
proxies will come in on all sides. The more you're going to get arming one side, the more the other side is going to feel justified in arming its allies. We know that we don't know that much. I mean, we know some about the opposition, but it, it itself is divided. Could you, Matt, could you see a situation where different groups of the opposition are armed and start fighting not just the regime, but one another? Listen, so I understand it when I talk to members of the Syrian opposition that they want to be armed. They feel like they're defenseless. But you know, taking a step back, I think it could be an extremely dangerous uh, development. Let's talk about the opposition. I want to talk about the regime, but first yeah. I want to do the opposition. Uh, you have the National Council exiles. Uh, you have inside an opposition and local coordinating committees as well who've been handling that early part of the demonstration and getting reports out to the West. You also have now this new element of the Free Syrian Army and, and are literally what amount to armed gangs, some coming into the country and some there in the country that have no relationship either to the army or the Syrian National Council. Uh, and then this report about members of the National Council resigning, right. claiming that it was sectarian and being led by one political uh, religious party. Uh, how cohesive, I mean, when they talk about arming, who is being armed and toward what end? Is it a cohesive opposition? No, um, I mean, oppositions often are not, co I think, sometimes people say, let's wait for it to be cohesive, let's wait, it has to be united. It probably, most oppositions are not, by definition, they, they you know, they, they start to fight among each other. In this case, they seem to be quite divided. Um, a lot of suspicions towards the SNC, towards the Free Syrian Army, not sure what the Free Syrian Army represents. Again, part of this is natural, but it does, it should act as a warning for those who are thinking of arming the opposition because, it's, as you say, it's not clear who you'd be arming and which force, will, you know, each one will try to take advantage of the, of the militarization to serve its own interests. So that's, that's one of the reasons, among others. I mean, let's not forget also that Syria is a country that which, which, with, which has significant uh, weapons of mass destruction. Once you start, once the whole country falls into violence, uh, what will happen to that? Talk about the regime itself. I mean, the, the party is a spent force, the Ba'ath Party. Mm -hmm. in, in many ways, it's ossified and has become a shell, much like the Bulgarian Communist Party in its, in its latter days. Um, but it does have a support base. I mean, the, 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 the regime does have a support base um, among some of the minority groups. Uh, and they play that card with them. How, how much support, how real the support of the does the regime have? I, I don't know. And the fact is, whenever I read people who either speak of polls or speak of their, you know, they give percentages of how, what percentage is with the opposition, what percentage with the regime, and what percentage is fence sitters, this is all speculation. We don't know. We never poll in Syria. I don't think and, it's and a place. For good reason. I don't think it's a place you can poll, even before. But analytically, I think it's one would, there certainly is an active support, which is probably not that broad, but active support for the regime. And then you probably have a, a, a group of people who don't like the regime but are at least as afraid of what might come next, and who also look around the region and they say, look at what's happening to Christians in Iraq or in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, look what's happening in minorities in different places. And that, the regime has played on that and has, has in fact exacerbated the sectarian dimension of the conflict precisely to frighten those in Syria who are, again, not sympathetic to the regime by any means, but are alarmed by what they, uh, what they fear might happen uh, were, it, were it to fall. And that, that's obviously one of the core is, aspects. From what you know, is the military cohesive? And is the military Ba'ath Party relationship strong enough? It, 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 people have talked about the possibility of a military coup. Would that solve anything? Or, or is that even in the cards? For, uh, several things. First, I mean, the Ba'ath Party, I, I don't know how significant it is today in the military elsewhere. I think what you have, there's two dimensions, is the security services which are very loyal to the regime and which, are, which there's, there's no indication that there's any cracks there. And they are the ones who are really the, the, the military components on the, on the regime side. The army itself, the regime from the beginning didn't trust it. It's never given it the kind of weaponry or the kind of power it would need to, to mount a, a genuine uh, coup or genuine, to represent a genuine threat towards the regime. So when you see the most of the military action that's taking place is not by the 350,000 strong army, it's by the 30,000, 40,000, whatever, whatever it is, strong security force, which is predominantly Alawite and which is much more loyal to the regime and which will probably fight to the death. Is there the possibility there? I mean, it, it, does Bashar al-Assad sit on top of that securely or not? So far, I think there is a feeling of 
you know, we, we, we sink or swim together. Mm -hmm. And the more this goes on, the more people are involved in this kind of violence, the more they know that there's no way out for them other than victory. I think when I spoke about the Russian card, I mean, the Russians do have ties to the security services, to the military, to all kinds of people in the regime. If they were to go to the, to the regime and say, here's a way out, it involves elections, it involves monitoring, it involves genuine opening, but you're going to have to accept it. There, and if the Assad regime, the family were to reject it, there you might see pressure brought to bear by those who are in positions of power in the security apparatus who will, who will say to themselves, we can't afford to lose Russia. We've lost too much already. That, I think, is the possibility that still remains. However, One last uh, question about Bashar yeah. uh, al-Assad, and that is his behavior uh, and the behavior of the security forces in the, the various cities that is ongoing. Um, he operates as if he can win, but one would question after this much bloodshed and this much uh, repression that uh, he may never recover or will never recover. Certainly. Let's define recover. I think if it means going back to a quote-unquote normal situation where the, where the regime is viewed as legitimate by a substantial majority of, of the population, I think that's very hard to imagine given, as you say, all the bloodshed and everything that's happened. Too many people have been affected. Uh, by it, so I think that that kind of if by that you, that's what you mean by recovery. I think that's out of the question. Could the regime last for some for a prolonged period of time? I don't think we can exclude it. I think people have gone. You know, the, the, the people are always looking for certainty. So there was this notion: the regime's days are numbered. Assad's days are numbered. Jimmy, our days are numbered too. I hate to I hate to break the news. Everyone's days are numbered. But people had this impression: there's no doubt it's going to fall within a year. It's going to fall within uh, 12 months, 14 months, 16 months. And now it's being replaced by this notion, well, maybe it's going to last forever. I mean, there are different ways of surviving and there are different ways of falling. And I think one has to think about those gray zones. Yes, it may well survive. What's it going to look like? It may fall, but it's very different if it falls through an arranged transition, smooth transition through a, a, with the security forces on board, or if it falls through military intervention from the West. There's a whole gamut of ways of lasting and ways of, of falling. And, and that's so where we're So let's have to assume think. that there is no victor vanquished scenario here. And let's assume that a civil war that continues on for a long period of time is unacceptable. What the third option becomes is a less than perfect, uh, stable situation that provides some degree of political transition, maybe not unlike the Taif agreement that ended the Lebanon Accord, the Lebanon. What happened in uh, Yemen? The question, though, is that in in the Lebanon one, I've often wondered. Who plays Syria in Syria? And mm -hmm. would it come with the same price that Syria exacted from Lebanon? Is there an external force? And in Yemen, it was the GCC. Yeah. Uh, they were trusted. Uh, I'm not sure the GCC plays that role in, in Syria. Definitely not. Who would? They, they become a combatant, in fact, one of the, one of the no, sides. This is where I, I, is I, there I, someone? Uh, the U.S. clearly doesn't have that relationship. Uh, the Russians do with the regime itself, but not with the, mm -hmm. the opposition. Who, who would play that role? Well, or for, could, is there someone there? First, I, I think the, the, the analogy with Lebanon it probably does, I mean, doesn't hold because of so many reasons. Uh, I don't think Syria would accept that kind of uh, domination by an outsider. Um, but I think it would take a combination. If you had the Russians, the Turks, and maybe a few others. People, some entities that have, some countries that have good ties with the regime, others that have good ties with the opposition, who c came together and said, this is a plan. Both of you are going to have to swallow something you don't want to swallow. The opposition is not going to get its clean break from the past. The regime is not going to get its, its perpetuation as is. Um, something in between those two, something in between these two notions right now, which are the most dangerous, survival of the regime at all costs, or toppling the regime regardless of consequence. I think those two things have to be off the table and to try to find some kind of pacted transition. Again, we're not there yet. Thank you for that. I want to shift gears just in the closing moments here and talk about Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some dramatic changes there. They, they left Syria. Uh, they were looking for homes, not a home, in several countries, some to some degree beneficiaries of this Arab Spring new dynamic that's unfolded. An agreement was reached with the Palestinian Authority, which some in the movement contest. Where is Hamas today, and are we seeing a changing role in that movement? Uh, Hamas is in a state of flux, no doubt about it. And both 
internally because of the divisions that you mentioned. Uh, this, there was real opposition to the agreement that Khaled Michel reached with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Very doubtful the that it's going to be. The president of the Palestinian president. Authority and the, the external political leader of Hamas. Right. Hard to imagine that th their agreement is going to be implemented precisely because of divisions in Hamas and other reasons uh, as well. And they're in flux externally, I mean, in terms of the region. They look at the region and uh, on the one hand they see very good news. The Muslim Brotherhood winning in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, as they see it probably winning elsewhere. That's the good news and they want to be part of that and that comes with some constraints. It means they, they may not be able to put the Palestinian agenda at the very top of the list of priorities. They may have to subsume them into other priorities. But there's also the less good news, which is what's happening in Syria, the sort of break of the axis of resistance, the tensions that that brings with Iran as well. I think we're seeing a Hamas in flux, and I think it's going to be very important to, to know how external actors, the West, but not just the West, but the West in particular, are going to act, because that could have a real influence on where Hamas ultimately ends up. And then in that context, the recent Israeli attack on uh, Islamic Jihad and the response to that and the fact that Hamas stayed out. Mm -hmm. um, are, are they trying to become a, a different force in Gaza? Well, that's not new, by the way. I mean, Hamas has stayed out of confrontation with Israel basically since 2008, since the last war. They don't <laughs> want a confrontation, but they also don't want to become what they used to accuse Fatah of being, which is the policeman that is policing other groups when they're at war with Israel. So. They've played this role now for some time. In this instance, I think it was all the more important for them because they have other issues that they're dealing with, and their relationship with Egypt, their relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood. So they didn't want this to explode, and they did their best to stay out of it. But as I said, they don't want to be the ones who are going to take action against groups that are at war with Israel because they, they resented it when Fatah was doing it to them. So what brought about the ceasefire? Was it Egypt, or was it simply that the Islamic Jihad had nowhere to go? I think it's a con conference of interest between Hamas and Israel. Neither one of them wanted escalation facilitated by, by Egypt. And Islamic Jihad can do what it does for some time, but ultimately they're not the strongest power in, in, in Gaza. And when Hamas really brings its pressure to bear, uh, they also have to, to have to listen to it. I don't think anyone intended this round of confrontation to be the ultimate round that may still be around the corner. I think everyone wanted it to be within certain bounds and that's, that's what turned out. One last question on Hamas, and that is um, in terms of the reconciliation agreement. You don't see it Im being implemented anytime soon. Um, what happens on the Palestinian front? Has Netanyahu succeeded in taking it off the agenda, replacing it with Iran as the, the, the big issue? I mean, he came Certainly. to the U.S. and there was no yeah. mention of the issue at all. Uh, is, it, is it gone till the election's over? I think and in which case, what does the Hamas and the PA do between now and November? I mean, I think, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu has a lot of things he could feel good about from his uh, premiership, and one of them is the strategic victory of having really put the Palestinian issue, not just him, I mean, others have contributed, but it, w it was, I think, a goal, and the, the Palestinian issue is barely registering today. I mean, they are, the, it's the forgotten conflict, which I never thought I would say, but it's now not a conflict people are focused on virtually anywhere. Which doesn't mean, by the way, that it couldn't, that's not a reason why things might explode, because at some point the Palestinians feeling not just ignored but without any prospect of progress, they may ultimately rise up in the West Bank. I think the next year, or however long it is, should be taken. I've said this for some time, the Palestinians should do some internal work. I think reconciliation is critical. I'm pessimistic because every time it moves, there's resistance from Fatah, from Hamas, and from external actors. I think the Palestinians have to realize at one point that they need to make their own decisions and that the only way they're going to succeed is by reviving and reuniting their national movement. No national movement that I know of has succeeded when it was divided and when it was fragmented. So that's one thing I think they need to do. They need to sort of figure out where they want to go, give up some of these addictions of the past on both Hamas and Fatah. I mean, the addiction, whether it's with armed struggle or with negotiations that go nowhere or with good relations with certain third parties. I think they need to, if they can, and it's not easy, decide their fate uh, in terms of what's best for the Palestinians. Thank you so much, uh, Rob Melly. Thanks. Listen, I want to uh, just tell you that uh, for issues involving Syria, we don't poll in Syria, but we've polled everywhere else in the region about Syria, and the results actually are quite quite stunning. Uh, Bashar al-Assad exhausted goodwill throughout the Arab world in a rather in rather short order. From 2007 till today, his numbers have plummeted. Uh, you'll find all of that information on our website at aaiusa.org. It's the most comprehensive uh, source of polling in the Arab world, Arab attitudes, uh, over the last uh, decade. And I uh, 
suggest you go take a look at it. Up next, I'm going to talk with Rick Nelson, senior fellow at CSIS, former Navy pilot who served in Afghanistan on possible U.S. options in the region. Don't go away. Thanks.